Um, so today what, what I'm presenting is, is a discussion of one of the age old questions um, of race, ancestry, population affinity, and um, um, and this has really, really come to a head in the last uh, three to four years, especially during uh, the pandemic uh, with the killing of George Floyd or the murder of George Floyd and all of these um, racial outrages that have um, been at the high point in the United States throughout this entire period. So with that, um, a lot of forensic anthropologists were asking themselves if we should even be estimating um, ancestry as part of the um, biological profile. And if by doing so, are we helping um, um, the, the racist structure of the justice system even marginalize individuals even more? Um, so I'm going to give you my perspective um, on this, and we're going to go back. We're not going to talk about, you know, our racist origins from the 1900s, 20s, and 30s. We're going to start, because um, those have been um, debated and discussed in numerous volumes already. So we're just going to talk about from like 1990 forward and show how the discipline <clears throat> changed and was viewed, and then we are changing again, like the whole paradigm is changing yet again, and how we're moving forward with um, some of these issues. And, and it's mostly in the area of how we actually conduct these, um, our research, how do we set up our research designs, samples, and that type of thing. So we, here I'm going to um, talk about um, the conflict between traditional and the theoretical aspect of biological anthropology and forensic anthropology again from 1990 to 2000 and then the period of growth in ancestry estimation from 2001 to 2010 and then the modern thesis which is 2011 through 2020, which is actually still continuing in 2023. So one of the big things that started um, this debate in the 90s was at the American Association of Physical Anthropologists meeting um, where um, there was a survey and individuals were asked to complete the survey, and this was, um, and 50% of biological anthropologists had accepted the race concept, 42 rejected the race concept, and this whole thing stimulated um, a series of papers, and I would say uh, critiques, criticisms, and um, throughout the next few years, you had the debate actually um, in print, right? Not just at these meetings. And by the big three divide, I mean the original typological viewpoint of um, estimating race or ancestry, which is white, black, Asian, slash, which includes Native Americans as well. So uh, this whole volume in social science and medicine in 1992 is where Sauer um, described that we had, you know, a two-stage role in forensic anthropology. One was to develop a biological profile, and two was for identification. And this included using racial terms, and he portrayed these as a pragmatic view because these are the terms that are used in the National Crime and Information Center and by law enforcement and medical examiners. So he was stating that we use the terms because that's how the justice system um, 
interprets them and uses them. And he also said in order for this assessment or this part of the biological profile to be useful, um, we must use those categories that would potentially be assigned to a missing persons. And so that way you could narrow down the missing person list, um, so to speak. And then in this volume is where he decided to change the very charged term of race and change it to ancestry instead. But the debate continued because was it just a name change or was it a really a difference in application? So Bruce, Alice Bruce also um, had a, in a paper in the same volume and she continued um, the discussion on race with discussion on data, e.g. she actually looked at and mentioned human variation and pushed for a shift of large scale continental uh, groupings of, such as white, black, Asian into more regional, tribal or um, local populations. Um, she also um, noted that there was a huge change in U.S. demographics and that the term Hispanic, which I hate, um, was not sufficient to account for the variation that you see from, let's say, individuals um, that are here from Cuba, individuals that are from Mexico, and even many generations, Mexican Mex uh, Mexicans, right? Uh, Texas Mexicans. And so she thought that um, we needed to really look at all of that variation, which is really interesting because people didn't really start talking about this, um, this Hispanic issue uh, until the 2000s. And um, no one actually gave her credit for this paper and bringing this up to begin with. And so, you know, we've had a lot of issues in biological anthropology in various areas of, you know, uh, the role of, you know, sexism and other things that intersect the discipline. So this was kind of a real eye opener that she actually stated this decades earlier and nobody had given her credit for that. <clears throat> So then this was also followed by um, a series of papers that turned into a book by the Napa Bulletin called Race, Ethnicity, and Applied Bioanthropology. And Alice Bruce in this piece um, was highly criticized for saying there is something there, and this is meaning estimating ancestry or race. And so everybody honed in on really criticized her about saying that. And the people that are doing most of the criticisms, um, we'll get to that in a minute. So there's you know, two camps of biological, uh, the theoretical part of biological anthropology, and then you have the applied discipline of uh, forensic anthropology. So one of the things that was brought up um, during the same time period, um, Ken Kennedy wrote a paper in the Journal of Forensic Sciences, why do we teach race identification if races don't exist, right? So if we're going to reject the biological concept of race, why are we teaching it? And um, again, he was actually very thoughtful about that paper, thinking that, well, we're teaching it again for the pragmatic view, and the major opponents of this whole conversation or debate uh, are Malagos and Goodman, and they really, really um, tied into it that they said in their statements that if you say race is not political, the fact that you are not taking a stance against social injustice is a political stance and that um, one shouldn't you know, come up with the excuse that it's just a pragmatic reason for doing so. And one of the things that he, his criticism was that I'm just doing my job was in fact 
a political stance. And in some of these papers, actually in numerous of these papers, he um, accused forensic anthropologists that it looked very much like the physical anthropology of the 20s and 30s that are based on racial typologies. And actually reviewing all of these things, um, we will get to 2020 soon enough, to 2019 also, um, that you know the approach hasn't really changed that much. And this goes back to sample selection and everything. So then we get to the part of 2001 through 2010, which is the what we, uh, Dr. Pulut and I determined or called it biological determinism. And this is where you start getting more and more studies in ancestry. Um, and a lot of them are still based on uh, the typological notions of, you know, using um, racial traits of the skull to assess ancestry. So we're using, you know, the typological aspects such as skull shape, um, you know, more of the morphological type things. And uh, Gill um, directly in 2009 in a book chapter directly states that race and ancestry are actually synonymous and he breaks it down to six races and these are geographical races um, that are based on some of the older typological um, studies from the 20s and 30s that they use the same kind of breakdown. So during this uh, biological determinism period from 2001 to 2010, you have a huge growth in methods and ancestry estimation using various skeletal elements. There was a whole series in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology um, called Race Reconciled, How, Bi How Biological Anthropologists View Human Variation. And in these series of papers, the conclusion was that it's not reconciled, we're still discussing and we have a difference of opinion and they were not able to actually come to a unified, let's say, front for um, um, their conference that, that this is based on. So during this period also, we had a book um, that came out, um, which it's, uh, the editor was uh, Clark Spencer Larson and talked about issues in forensic anthropology and New Locker in his paper um, carefully outlined that for uh, those Hispanic individuals that careful notes must be taken um, to describe, um, you know, the skeletal variation that is observed. So race or ancestry, or is it the same thing? In the 1990s race, which was a huge discipline at odds, again, began in 1987. Uh, forensic anthropologists argued for a pragmatic position. Um, it got so contentious, actually, that um, forensic anthropology used to have a session at the AABAs but then they were kicked out for being too applied and not theoretical enough. And because of this whole race debate, um, they were no longer allowed to have a session at the AABAs. Thankfully, I went this year and they're back. So hopefully everything has calmed down. In 2008 to 2019, ancestry studies still that heavy trifecta, the Africa, Europe, Asia, or black, white, Hispanic, Asian, where they're conflating ancestry, language, country, and geographic region, still using the term Hispanic when it was advised not to use as Hispanic uh, has no biological meaning, it's based on language. Um, and population history structure is something that has 
was not considered. So the modern synthesis, um, growth of validation studies of all of these uh, methods, uh, growth of online programs to estimate ancestry, um, also testing the accuracy of ancestry estimates. But one of the problems with these is that they haven't been completely validated, right? And so individuals are using programs that are just placed up for everyone to use without maybe a cautionary statement that these have not been validated and if we're doing it in a medical legal setting, um, you know, should proceed with caution. So ancestry, question, is it a crucial component of the biological profile? Well, since 2018, I believe there was a back and forth in letters to the editor in the Journal of Forensic Sciences, where you have one camp of forensic anthropologists that completely um, state that it is not, and that actually we should not be doing it at all, because what we're doing is further marginalize the already marginalized. Um, it has also been stated it's one of the most difficult parameters to assess from the biological profile. And um, race, ancestry, ethnicity is conflated by forensic practitioners and government. And a big example is the US Census. You know, every time I fill out the census, they change something, they add countries, they add ethnicity, they take that out, they throw in ancestry, and they're conflating language, cultural um, associations um, all together. Uh, since 2019, uh, 2009 through 2019, the word ancestry was used in the title of 20 papers in JFS. Race was used in two papers in 2010 and 2011. So we did see a big shift from race to ancestry, but the methodologies and approaches to this estimation um, continue to be the same. So these are uh, some of the keywords when we did a keyword search in the journal Forensic Sciences. So the papers use black, white, Hispanic, black, white, African European, black, white, prehistoric, Native American, Polynesian. As you can see, there are various iterations of the trifecta, the big three, and also with the addition in some cases of Hispanic that has no biological meaning. And to even conflating this where you have um, racialized labels like white, black, and then you add countries like Chinese, Japanese. And so even in, within our discipline, these are all in forensic anthropology, we're conflating um, this terminology. And um, I recently sat, sat on the American Academy Standards Board and we did um, a standard for population affinity, um, which took four years of my life that I will never get back to finally get it to a standard that we're actually using population affinity and kind of doing away with some of these things. And one of the things within multiple discussions over the years is that um, there is no clear definition for ancestry and people have a really difficult time to even describing or defining what that means. So one of the things um, that we use to study prehistoric populations is that we know that we use craniofacial variation as a neutral evolutionary model, and that generally contiguous populations are more similar to each other um, we have ma uh, microevolutionary forces like gene flow drift and migration, which are um, responsible for um, diversification. And these studies show, even in our prehistoric world, um, that we should abandon this tricontinental approach as that it does not reflect um, all of these microevolutionary forces. 
that is a complex interaction between the environment and these forces. And what we called for, uh, uh, Dr. Palud and I, and it has taken on some movement in the last few years that we need to adopt a population structure approach um, to estimating population affinity. And that means moving away from the trifecta. I am not in the camp that says that we should not estimate this parameter um, because I feel if we can provide some answers, it will narrow down um, the search for missing persons. And if we don't provide that, you know, you're just left with, you know, biological sex, age, and, um, well, it hasn't been determined yet whether it causes more harm or not, but I don't believe it does as long as you do it um, ethically and respectfully. So I'm going to give you uh, an example of one of the studies that I did with Dr. Williams. And we use Panama, which is my place of birth, um, as kind of the focus of these complex interactions between um, <clears throat> populations and population movements. And as an example of a population structure approach to um, studying individuals. So I had, uh, we used 397 uh, individuals. Uh, and they include samples from um, Central America, Caribbean, South America, and we also used a sample from Spain um, as our comparative sample, right? Because we're dealing with, you know, um, during the period of conquest, colonialism, and all of this, so we needed a baseline. So, um, in this study, we used uh, coordinate data, which is XYZ coordinates. We used 14 type 1 and type 2 landmarks. And the reason you use type 1 and type 2 landmarks because they are more uh, so, uh, closely associated to biological form, which includes size and shape. And if you use type 3, there is a significant amount of error included there. So generally, I use the type 1 and type 2s. Um, so the first thing you do is a super, uh, superimposition technique, excuse me, generalized Procrustes analysis. And this is where the orientation of the specimens between the data acquisition, um, um, the landmarks are centered, centered and scaled, and then centered, scaled. As you can see over here, these are, let's say you collect data on two individuals. and this is how it comes in. So then you have to center all the landmarks. You have to center and scale everyone so that they are all, they are, they are all on the same um, plane. And this is the only true way, not traditional cranium metrics, which are, are caliper based, of actually separating um, centroid size or our size variable from shape and they can be examined um, individually and independently. So for this study, we used uh, Klingenberg's lab morph 4 j um, SAS, um, who does jump, and Geoda. And for these, we, we actually included also spatial analysis as in what the program Geoda does. And we included um, distance, uh, in kilometers and also um, geographic, like spatial distance. Um, so what we found in the study is that centroid size was significantly different among the different samples and so was shape. And this was due to uh, the Procrustes ANOVA after superimposition. And then we ran a hierarchical cluster analysis uh, based on the Mahalanobis distance matrix. And Mahalanobis distances are essentially, um, it, it's a, uh, which it shows commonality, right? So we use these as akin to, let's say, a genetic distance to show relationships between and among populations. 
And what we found that kind of highlights this, you have the Chilean and Spanish samples clustered together, and then everyone else kind of, you know, their trees fall off. You have also Colombia comes out. What was interesting that Colombia was not closer to Panama. We also had an enslaved African sample uh, from Cuba and Puerto Rico was the most dissimilar to everyone else. And you can see this here that uh, Puerto Rico is three times more different than the other populations or samples that are shown at various levels of difference here. Um, then we plotted the wireframe graphs. Here we use the consensus configurations and the consensus configuration, you have a consensus configuration from each sample where we can um, show the direction and magnitude of change. And you can see the similarity. So we looked at uh, the similarity between Chilean and Spanish males and variation between enslaved Africans and Puerto Ricans. And so Chile is uh, in teal, Spain is in blue. So what's happening here, it's one consensus, the shape changes that you see is one consensus uh, configuration being deformed into the other one. And this is where you would see where the changes are. And as you can see between enslaved uh, Africans and Puerto Rico, you see changes in, um, at the landmark asterion, which is a breadth measurement, um, also a length measurement at lambda. And then you also see some facial changes here. And um, on this. Uh, yeah. I think you accidentally muted, muted yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Is it better? Yes. Okay. Better. I gotta say, got it here, I guess. Ignore. All right. And again, the arrows show the changes in uh, facial breath. I guess keeps muting. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, good. Because I keep getting yeah. the thing that pops up. Uh, okay. Uh, you shouldn't. No, now everything seems to be all right. Let me see if it'll let me advance. Yeah, it's not letting me advance my slide. Um, okay. Maybe I need to get bigger. Yeah, it seems to be stuck. <laughs> yeah, it seems like. Um, can you maybe stop and restart the screen sharing? Yeah, let me do that. No, I don't want to do that. Okay, stop. All right, I'm going to try this again. Stopping already worked. Yes. So now we know. Share. Ah, that worked. Yay. Um, so for part of the spatial analysis, um, this is similar to what is used in in uh, GIS. Um, so what we use here is Moran's eye, which is a product moment coefficient. And we used um, a spatial autocorrelation of shape. And you can only, unfortunately, in some of these, you, you can only use one variable. So we use the first principal component as it was most of, you know, a big portion of the variation was found on PC1. And the autocorrelation is a measure of uh, the gen genetic similarity between individuals with reference to separation, latitude, and longitude. 
and it uses you know distance between these latitude and longitude measures. So what we found and that was interesting is shape was um, obviously significant. So shape does change. Let's say you know the further you move, the further a population moves away from that original point, the more variation you will see, right? So the the populations that are closest together, which shows that they're more um, similar to each other the closer you are to each other and the more dissimilar you are to each other the further away you are and the same held true for um, centroid tests so what you look for when you're really dealing with a spatial correlelogram is to examine um, if it's just geographic distance, and if you're dealing with isolation by geographic distance, this is what it should look like, right? So more similar, less distance, more dis similar as distant moves. And this is a nice isolation by distance, um, I guess model is what you were looking for. However, um, even though shape, which is PC1 and cranial size, were significantly um, different from each other, but this correlelogram shows that it is not related to isolation by distance. In fact, um, their spatial autocorrelation is non-monotonic, meaning it indi indicates multiple migrations from different directions, uh, such as the impact of Spanish colonialism and um, the European slave trade. So you have people coming in, people leaving. Um, for example, in Panama, you know, when they built the Panama Canal, um, they brought in individuals from all over the world, a huge Chinese population to help with these hum um, very, very large um, earthworks um, that they did. So that is just one example um, that we're trying to use um, is to show you how we can use like some of these models that are used in, you know, ecology and actually that, you know, they were being used, for example, by, you know, numerical taxonomy by Sokol, um, as by Sneath and Sokol, which have been ignored um, since then, but this would be a great model to actually, when looking at variation and diversity, we should apply some of these models to then better inform us on how to maybe um, group samples and individuals for, um, for an informed position. So the revolution is that, yes, ancestry, was a synonym for race. Uh, Armelagus was correct in calling us out. Ancestry studies, um, even until very recently, and based on the samples used, are typological in nature because a lot of them reflect that big three uh, continental approach. And something that has been ignored, I think, um, in forensic anthropology, which, you know, some of our more theoretical uh, biological anthropologists include when looking at migration patterns, um, we have ignored the effects of colonialism, epidemics, the transatlantic slave trade, and we have not really examined the population structures of the individuals we're trying to identify. So, what we called for is a population structure approach to estimate population affinity. And that is something that is moving more closely towards that end uh, based on the new standards. Um, hopefully they'll be printed soon. Like I said, that was uh, four years in the making. We did not argue as much about estimating biological sex. That one was an easy standard to get through. Um, but anyway, we're almost there. 
So some of the things that the reform asked for is that, um, yes, ancestry supplanted race without the accompanying changes in typology and uh, hypotheses testing. And we need to move away from racialized terminology. Uh, we need to begin by having um, thoughtful hypotheses and moving away the big three and also very carefully consider trait um, selection, whether they have uh, an evolutionary origin to them or is it an environmental difference or some of these things need to be determined before actually just kind of applying it um, uh, applying it in a blanket approach. So the things that we're trying is to reimagine the approach to modern human variation. We've been very good at doing it in, um, for past populations, but we haven't been um, as careful with these hypotheses um, for forensic use. Um, one of the things that we have found out that contemporary human variation is not just clinal, but it's a lot more complex. And you can see that complexity within this population and spatial approach to examining variation. Um, that structural violence and um, unidentified decedents are closely tied as most of the people that end up in a forensic anthropology lab are the marginalized in life and those that have been marginalized after death. And so these are things that um, we need to uh, be cognizant of when we're actually um, working these cases. And one of the things that, and I will, the last point, cremation, the contemporary face of structural violence, is an example from the state that I live in, which is North Carolina. Um, uh, for example, if the family members cannot afford um, a cremation or a burial, the state will cremate those remains for the families, but because the state paid for the cremation, they are not returned to the family members. Instead, they are kept for I think around three to four years and then their ashes are, are actually scattered at sea. So these again, who does it affect, right? The marginalized, the people that can't afford the astronomical uh, increase in funerary uh, prices. And um, so these individuals do not get to um, you know, say goodbye to their loved ones because of uh, socioeconomic issues. One thing also is um, the United States lags behind Europe in adopting inter international humanitarian laws. Just recently, um, the last few years, we are doing a lot in trying to identify the unidentified decedents that cross our borders, but as due to all of this uh, immigration, um, more and more individuals that may be undocumented will end up in our laboratories, which they do in mine. Um, but there's no real connection between really trying to make those IDs and working um, to secure identifications with other embassies uh, across you know, the world or, or even Latin America. Um, another thing also um, for the missing, and we have a huge problem with missing indigenous women and children, uh, missing people of color, but everything that you see in the news, it's what we call the missing white women syndrome that People only care if you're young, beautiful, blonde, and other individuals that go missing um, are not given the same kind of uh, publicity as I'm not, I'm sure you all 
heard it was around the world, like the Gabby P Petito case, where you have thousands of other missing individuals that don't get that kind of, um, uh, you know, television, news, attraction, and publicity. That um, is one thing that we're all trying to also address. And that's what I have for you.